<laughs> well, okay. So the, our next speaker is Takis Contos from uh, Ecole Normale Superior of Paris and France. And he's going to be talking about strong inhomogeneity of spin orbit interaction at the nanoscale. Please go ahead, Takis. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I feel I'm a bit out of topic, uh, but um, anyway, I mean, it's always a pleasure um, to uh, attend this very nice conference. Uh, uh, although, I mean, usually it's uh, uh, like uh, in person in India, which is uh, very nice um, to talk um, and, to, uh, and to enjoy the place. Uh, but nevertheless, it's very nice uh, to, um, uh, to attend this conference, uh, uh, although it's uh, online. And so today I'm going to talk about um, um, a recent work which has been done uh, um, by my um, former PhD student, Lauriane Contamin and uh, William Legrand uh, and Tino Kuben. Uh, uh, and uh, also uh, I have had the main collaborator on this, uh, uh, who is uh, Matthew Delbeck. And so you see all these people here. And we have benefited also from the longstanding collaboration with Audrey Cote and also from a very nice collaboration with Magdalena Marganska from Regensburg and, and also from his uh, uh, magnetic colleagues, Stan Roar and Andre Thiaville. So today uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, um, a hybrid system uh, where we can induce, uh, uh, so a hybrid one-dimensional system where we can induce a very, a very strongly and homogeneous spin orbit interaction, uh, shear varying at the nanoscale level. And so uh, for this, uh, um, I would like to introduce uh, uh, what we call a hybrid mesoscopic circuits. Uh, uh, and uh, so which essentially we form uh, experimentally in the lab. And it's essentially this sketch which I have uh, uh, um, done here. So um, uh, I have sketched our, our working horse, which is a single wall carbon nanotube, but this is valid for any type of uh, low dimensional conductor, of course. Uh, and which is essentially attached to leads, uh, uh, thanks to these yellow patches uh, here and there. And these yellow patches can have uh, various uh, properties. They can be magnetic materials, direct magnetic materials. And I'm going to focus today on um, uh, magnetic materials, uh, which uh, actually are very interesting to shape the spinful spectrum of the states uh, hosted by the carbon nanotubes, although the carbon nanotube itself is non-magnetic. OK, so this is the hybrid, uh, like this kind of the concept of uh, hybrid mesoscopic uh, uh, circuits. And it's actually um, like uh, very widespread uh, nowadays. Uh, um, for example, for uh, uh, induced topological server connectivity in uh, two dimensional uh, uh, semiconducting hinder structures. OK, uh, we can actually put uh, another degree of complexity on this kind of system. Uh, so, in, in the, what we call a hybrid square mesoscopic circuits, uh, so, um, um, which is actually coupling these kind of hybrid electronic circuits, which I have sketched here again. So I, now I have discrete levels because uh, uh, one of our focuses is uh, with quantum dots, but it can be anything. Uh, so the idea is actually to train to uh, to put uh, one more degree of uh, of hybrid uh, mass, uh, which is uh, to couple these guys to a single mode of the electromagnetic field trapped into this uh, green uh, cavity. So for us, uh, um, uh, the green cavity is a microwave resonator. So with typical resonance frequencies uh, um, similar to what has been, was, was presented uh, uh, yesterday. <clears throat> uh, uh, so about uh, like several gigahertz, like six gigahertz typically uh, resonance frequency. And of course, uh, one of the first questions which can ask uh, to ourselves uh, um, uh, is, is it possible to address single spins with microwave lights? And so this is going to be um, uh, like you, you uh, Jason Peta will, will tell you more about this uh, uh, tomorrow, I guess. And so the idea is to transfer the, uh, all the concepts of uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics, which have taught us to probe, uh, manipulate uh, macroscopic and microscopic quantum states uh, to these kind of circuits. But uh, today, uh, and so this is uh, something which is worldwide, I mean, pursued uh, intensively. But today I'm going to change uh, uh, gear and uh, actually I'm going to try to ask the question, uh, is uh, this kind of uh, um, platform uh, useful for more condensed matter problems? And uh, um, 
in particular, um, topologically oriented uh, problems. So meaning that we, we, we uh, is it possible to measure quantities uh, which are very much relevant uh, for inducing topological um, states, uh, for example, topological structural connectivity? Uh, um, is it possible to measure these uh, uh, like ingredients which are relevant for that uh, thanks to this platform? And I'm going to show you that it is actually possible in particular, if one wants to uh, shape the, the, the spin full spectrum of uh, this, kind of, this kind of systems. Okay, and in order to shape the spin full spectrum, uh, uh, like one thing which is important and a very important ingredient is to uh, uh, have a, uh, an interaction between the spin and the motion of the uh, charge carriers. Um, and so, um, and so the, uh, the idea is to uh, be able, maybe with this kind of platform to actually directly measure um, the spin orbital interaction induced in, in one dimensional in one dimensional uh, conductor and so well there are two uh, things which can uh, <clears throat> happen in, uh, now the first thing is that uh, uh, you take uh, essentially material uh, which has the right property so um, which has very uh, large spin orbital interaction and you try to probe this material with the um, microwave resonator so that's one way of, of, of uh, and then after you can build on this material to make, for example, a topological spherical connector. But uh, uh, what we um, actually um, uh, worked on recently is a different strategy. And, uh, and essentially it's to instead uh, um, uh, try to engineer uh, a spin away interaction with a magnetic texture. Uh, and this uh, could in principle, uh, uh, circumvent a lot of material problems uh, which one has to face uh, when building this kind of uh, uh, platform. Okay, so how can we do this? So there are many theory proposals which I proposed this uh, some time ago. Uh, and so the idea is, uh, especially if we want to induce a, uh, like the most, like a very useful uh, form of the spinomid interaction, which is the Rajba spinomid interaction. Um, you can essentially take your favorite one-dimensional system. So for us, it's a single world carbon atom. It can be anything else. And uh, you actually couple it to um, a cycloidal field, for example, or it works also with a spiral field. I think. And if you do this, uh, um, these folks here have shown that, uh, um, um, in fact, um, um, the um, uh, uh, if you're able to do this, uh, you will uh, um, have a built-in spin orbital interaction whose magnitude will just be the uh, inversely proportional to the pitch of these uh, domains. And, uh, and in addition, it will be equivalent to uh, the fact to the, the situation where you would in addition have a, a constant uh, a Zeman field uh, B in the laboratory, which will just be the amplitude of these field oscillations. Okay, and so, and so this is the concept of synthetic spin orbit interaction. So a lot of interesting things uh, um, are a priori very interesting and useful if one is able to do this. Uh, first, it's highly versatile because uh, it allows you to take, to pick up your favorite conductor, like the best one dimensional system you can think of, for example, uh, which does not necessarily have spin orbit interaction and to, engineer a finite spin orbit interaction in it. It's of course better compatible with superconducting circuits. Uh, so not only microwave resonators, but also superconducting contacts. And uh, last but not least, and this is going to be a very important aspect of our talk today, you can uh, in principle pattern regions uh, for diff with different spin orbit interactions or different um, uh, uh, like, uh, like um, um, uh, values uh, like uh, or orientations of the spin orbit interaction. And this can be very interesting, for example, if you want to engineer um, exotic bound states um, or hinge states even uh, in these kind of systems. Okay. And so this uh, uh, is essentially what I'm going to talk to you about today. So in order to talk to, talk to you about this one, of course, has first to make devices. And uh, that's the principle of our device fabrication. I will flash you this very quickly. Essentially, we grow single wall nanotubes on the comb, which is here. And we staple the nanotube under vacuum 
in this kind of setup here. Now this is a vacuum chamber, which was like, a, so you have a piezo stack and you staple the nanotube inside a microwave cavity, which was sketched uh, there, sorry. Which was sketched here, this is the microwave cavity. Okay, and you can essentially, this is how we make the devices. That's, that's the com, that's a single nanotube here, which is kind of have here and there. And that's a, a view from the side with the, with the uh, bits here and, and a device. <clears throat> and this is uh, our uh, magnetic material from which we make the magnetic texture. It's just a cobalt platinum stack. And so if I image uh, the magnetic textures, uh, this is typically what I have. So this is, this is you see on, on the three micron scale here, this full bar. That the magnetic uh, um, um, stripes, and you see that if I do a cut along this line, from if I see um, uh, the magnetic force microscope signal, I have essentially something uh, which doesn't show magnetic signal, and suddenly you have a magnetic signal. But you see this magnetic signal has modulations in space pretty fast on so hundreds of nanometers. Then there is no magnetic signal. Then there is again magnetic signal, etc. So here you have the basic ingredient of uh, two of the patterning of uh, thin spin ohmic interaction, um, which can be potentially strong because you see the speech is very small. So if you have a large Fermi velocity, it can turn uh, like to be very uh, uh, a very large energy scale. And you see, uh, um, since for example, I mean these oscillations are not necessarily the same phase or not the same amplitude. Uh, you have a, a, a built-in a staggered a, a spin ohmic interaction in this, in principle. <clears throat> okay. So how do you probe this? Uh, how, how to probe this uh, inhomogeneity, this potential inhomogeneity with two magnetic textures? So I, I'm going to do something uh, can't, completely counterintuitive. I will couple it. Uh, so I want to see a very strongly inhomogeneous uh, uh, a thing uh, which is potentially inhomogeneous on hundreds of nanometers. Uh, and I'm going to couple it uh, to uh, a microwave field, uh, which, is, uh, which has a centimetric wavelength. That's completely crazy, in fact, to do this. But in fact, it's not like, uh, okay, in principle, but it's actually not so crazy because the uh, microwave field, uh, of course, is, has a very large wavelength. But uh, if you look at the near field uh, structure, it actually allows you to probe uh, matrix elements uh, which uh, correspond to uh, actually microscopic dipoles. That's what everyone is doing, for example, uh, for double quantum dots in micro embedded in microwave cavities. So you have a mesoscopic dis distance from here and there, and the microwave field is, is able to induce transition from the left and the right, which means that it takes a, a wave function here and compare this wave function to the wave function there. And this is how um, it can, is it, it's potentially able to distinguish between the spinful states here and the spinful state there. And that's exactly what we do here. We measure, uh, we make this device, we put it inside the microwave cavity and we measure the transmission through this microwave cavity and, uh, uh, and this is how we can uh, um, um, witness uh, the very strong inhomogeneity. Okay, just uh, um, to be a bit more specific on, on what we measure with a microwave cavity. Um, essentially, from a linear response uh, argument, uh, you can see that uh, the um, microwave uh, cavity uh, whose transmission uh, close to the resonance has this uh, form, uh, the amplitude, uh, is actually directly is able to directly read out uh, the charge susceptibility of the system. And in our case, since I have, uh, you see uh, this kind of setup, uh, which is in fact a double quantum dot, uh, I just uh, have the charge susceptibility of a double quantum dot to read out. And so this is uh, uh, kind of routinely now uh, um, uh, done in this kind of circuit QED architecture. Essentially, um, the real part uh, of um, um, of the um, um, of uh, this uh, uh, charge susceptibility will just be uh, um, uh, a dispersive effect will change the cavity frequency, and the imaginary part will change the damping. 
And so a very interesting thing happens uh, uh, when you are actually not far, when your spin states or charge states are not far from the resonator frequency. Now, uh, in fact, um, in this situation, um, the cavity provides a cut of the hybrid uh, double quantum dot spectrum at a, a condition where the cavity frequency equals the double quantum dot uh, doublet frequency, which corresponds to the bonding and tight bonding states of the system. And so this means that by changing the control parameters uh, uh, which control the double quantum dot frequency, so in our case, uh, these are going to be uh, the external magnetic field and uh, the difference between the potential applied to this gate and the potential applied to this gate. Um, so by just moving these two parameters, we will be able to reconstruct uh, the hybrid double quantum dot spectrum and to tell uh, about uh, these matrix elements and the, rela and, and the uh, related spectrum. Okay. Okay, so... So, that is, yeah. so, that is, so uh, if I understand correctly, to start with, you didn't have any direct tunneling uh, or coherent tunneling between these double dots, right? Yes, so thank you very much for this very important question. I have a, a direct tunneling, which is spin uh -huh. independent in principle, uh -huh. which comes from these okay. barriers here. But, uh, but the states uh, here and there have a spin structure a priori. And okay. since uh, okay. the tunneling is spin independent, I just do this direct uh, projection of the, let's say, spinful states here and the spinful states there. Mm -hmm. I see. Is that I see. clear? I see. I see. Yeah, I see. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thank, you for the, thank you for this very important question. Okay, so, um, so okay, so then, um, uh, uh, so let's start uh, uh, and look at the, um, characteristic signatures uh, of actually the coherent tunneling through the left and the right dot. Uh, and so this you directly see in the phase of the transmitted microwave signal. So if I look at the phase now of the transmitted microwave signal, whenever I activate this tunneling, and this happens when this state and this state, uh, uh, the left and the right state are uh, resonant, I have a large signal. So this corresponds to this situation here or a situation where actually this charger goes closer to the, uh, to the resonator frequency. And so how does it look like in a 2D map where I change uh, the left uh, gate electrode and a right gate electrode? It looks like uh, uh, this kind of stick here, here, here you barely see it, uh, in the VG right and VG left uh, map. Okay, here it's VG1 and VG2. This is exactly, it's just a different notation. I apologize for that. So you see, so these are two different devices uh, uh, which actually uh, have, you see this uh, coherent tunneling between the left and the right. You see the same thing here and there. So for the moment, you don't know what's going on. You just see coherent tunneling. You don't know whether there are spinful stays or not. Uh, and in fact, uh, these are two different devices. This is the, de a device, the device with the magnetic textures, uh, potentially different. And this is a control device which doesn't have these magnetic textures. So for the moment, they don't, they look roughly similar. The contrast is slightly different, but qualitatively, this is uh, very similar. Okay, and so, okay, let's be a bit more specific now about um, how uh, things work. Um, so, um, um, and so this is uh, related to uh, what uh, the, the microwave cavity is able to, to, to sense. So imagine now you start at zero magnetic field. As I told you, this, this condition is the condition where you have a maximal signal in the phase. These are these conditions here and there. When now you start to apply a magnetic field, there are two different situations. Either you have exactly the same spin spectrum on the left and the right dot. So characterized in particular by the same Lambda factors. And therefore, when we apply finite magnetic field, both move in the same way. In this situation, you don't expect something to change. You will just follow this, uh, uh, this uh, resonant condition. And, and so what will happen is that uh, if I do a map uh, where this P prime parameter is just the external magnetic field and this epsilon D is uh, this, uh, uh, the difference between the left and the right potential, you expect something completely horizontal. 
So this is the case of homogeneous left and right spin spectrum. So which is a particular case of a homogeneous spin orbital interaction or no spin orbital interaction because you have exactly the spin spectrum on the left and the right dot if you have no spin orbital interaction at all. Of course, something different happens if you have a strongly homogeneous spin spectrum and in fact, particularly strongly homogeneous spin orbital interaction, which is like, the, like the, the only way to make it in homogeneous at this scale uh, uh, on the nanotube. In this situation, you will change differently the left dot and the right dot when you apply an extra magnetic field. And what you expect is to actually be able to compensate that by applying a finite detuning between the left and the right gate. In this situation, this striper will disperse in the gate detuning and in the, in the extra magnetic field the, the map. And so this dispersion, which doesn't have to be necessarily linear, is the direct signature of a strongly homogeneous spin orbit. Even more importantly, if the dispersion slope is larger than the width, the width being um, like directly related to the coherent hopping between the left and the right dot, uh, this means that you are in a strongly homogeneous regime, meaning that the, the inhomogeneity is larger than the hopping uh, term between the left and the right dot. So that's the right measurement of, uh, or of the inhomogeneity in an elementary chain is how much the kinetic term, how much U in homogeneity is larger than the kinetic term, which is just the hopping term. Okay, so let's see what's going on. So that's the, that's the control device where we don't expect to have any homogeneous spectrum. And as expected, you have the stripe, which is completely horizontal as a function of the detuning and the extra magnetic field. That's this situation. The two levels are all the same way with the true magnetic field. So the control device behaves as, the, as it should be. If I now look at the uh, um, uh, original device uh, uh, with two magnetic textures, what you see is you have a strongly homogeneous, like you have a strong dispersion, larger actually than the, than the width. Uh, and, uh, and actually it's non-monotonic here. Uh, also, the contrast changes. Uh, you will see that we understand this. And so this is exactly a particular case of what I was sketching before. So this means that this device with two magnetic textures has a very strongly hom inhomogeneous um, uh, spinful uh, spectrum between the left and the right dot. And the two air levels, uh, as a consequence, evolve differently with the external magnetic field. Okay, so actually, now we can play the same game uh, by looking at different uh, uh, pairs of uh, orbital levels. And, and if I go back uh, quickly by essentially looking at different uh, uh, states here, which corresponds to different charge states and different orbital states. That's one thing which is the main thing which we'd like to see uh, if we talk about spin orbit interaction is that this difference in the spin for uh, spectrum changes uh, if I consider different orbitals. And you see that you have a whole zoology of uh, dispersions so you can have like a V shape, you can have a W shape or an inverting W shape or a lambda shape, or you like have the whole zoology. And so, which means that uh, you have a qualitatively different evolution of uh, the external, like as a function of the extramagnetic field in the detuning. Um, if I consider different orbitals. Huh? And, uh, and so this is really showing that first you have a, we have engineers spin full, uh, spin orbital, like a spin orbit interaction, the initial of the two dots, and that this spin orbit interaction is strongly homogeneous. Uh, so you have like here a staggered situation where you have two different values between the left and the right. Okay, and if I look at this slope, I convert this into an energy, you have a, I have a, essentially an effective long factor in homogeneity between 10 and 60, which is, uh, much larger than what we would expect for a few elections, which is g equal to. Okay. Okay. And so this, in fact, uh, we can uh, qualitatively understand what's going on. Uh, if I have this spin, the, the texture, I engineer uh, a finite spin orbit interaction. But when I change the gate voltages, I change essentially the wavelength of each of the orbitals, which means that I change. Uh, the different, uh, um, essentially, um, uh, the overlap between the wave functions and uh, uh, the magnetic uh, um, um, uh, modulations uh, coming from the gate. So, so that's when I change the detuning. And when I change the extra magnetic field, 
I have, for example, bigger domains, and again, the overlap gets different. We can quantitatively understand this uh, by working out the low energy spectrum of this thing. So this is uh, what happens for each of the two dots uh, co coming from the synthetic spin orbit interaction. So, well, essentially, uh, we took into account the spin and the valley, but the take home message is that essentially you have, um, uh, you, you, you have a very strongly homogeneous uh, polarization and, uh, of, and, um, and um, um, as a function of, for the spin and the spin valley here, which is characteristic of the spin orbit interaction. So this is for each dot. And of course, this has to be multiplied by two because we have two dots coupled coherently with this uh, hopping T here. That's the detuning. And if we look at, at the, low, the two lowest energy states, it's essentially a spin to be Hamiltonian uh, with effective uh, um, uh, longer factors and effective uh, magnetic fields, uh, local magnetic fields. Okay. And so if I plug this into this, uh, what I presented to you for the, um, the church susceptibility, here's what we get. So this is the data on the left, and this is the uh, um, uh, theory on the right. So this model captures uh, quantitatively the uh, essential physics of our inhomogeneous spin orbit interaction. Okay. So I have shown you that we can really um, uh, uh, induce a, um, a very strong inhomogeneous spin on interaction in this kind of setup. But um, um, okay, like, since I anticipate that many people will tell me about uh, uh, where is it possible uh, with this kind of uh, magnetic texture to engineer anything which looks like a, a topological uh, state, in particular, a superconducting uh, um, topological state related to topological superconductivity. I show you a previous work which we actually, uh, or in which we actually are, or already used uh, um, this uh, kind of um, uh, magnetic texture, but only one, uh, and uh, and where actually we had superconductors uh, uh, instead of normal metals, and this magnetic texture, where we actually did essentially exactly the same trick, uh, but looked at the transport instead of looking at the at the cavity. And we even saw so, um, uh, uh, signatures uh, uh, in, in the form of a zero bias peak and at zero magnetic field uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Meyer and excitations. So I'm showing you this uh, because uh, now we are ready to combine uh, what I have just shown to you and uh, what we have had already done, which is published in this paper, uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, measure uh, and manipulate uh, uh, Meyer and quasi particles. Uh, um, uh, with uh, um, uh, the microwave cavity. And so this is a theory proposal which we did together with Audrey Cotin and Benoit Dussault, where we actually uh, saw um, that um, uh, it is actually possible to prove uh, the self adjoint property of my ion excitations by embedding uh, uh, this kind of uh, um, structure in the microwave cavity. So you see that we are now ready to, to bring the two things together in order to, uh, uh, to do uh, directly this measurement. Okay, uh, so um, uh, as a conclusion, I have shown you that uh, it is actually to uh, uh, go pretty far in engineering spin Hamiltonians with magnetic elements in mesoscopic systems. Uh, so uh, I have done this using my working horse, uh, which is a single wall carbon nanotube, but uh, this can be of course uh, um, um, completely extended to any kind of uh, system. So uh, um, semiconducting nanowires, uh, two-dimensional electron gas. Um, and so uh, this uh, um, uh, in particular enables one, uh, thanks to use of the magnetic texture to engineer a finite a large spin orbit uh, interaction. And so uh, we have actually shown even more importantly that we can implement thanks to this uh, a very strongly homogeneous uh, uh, spin orbit interaction or staggered spin orbit interaction at the nanoscale. So uh, changing really on several hundreds of, of, of hundred nanometer scale. And this can be revealed uh, by uh, coupling this to uh, microwave light in a, a high finesse microwave cavity. Uh, uh, and there is more coming in uh, first the patterning of topological regions with magnetic textures and uh, um, uh, the use of the tricks of circuit quantum electrodynamics to uh, 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 sense particle and antiparticle duality. But even more, there is more to come. Uh, even now for the breeding and the manipulation and, and just the, the fusion uh, 
uh, we, we, we think that we can also do this with microwave cavity. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Takis, for this wonderful talk. Uh, so there were a few questions during the talk, but if there are any more, please just unmute yourself and go ahead from the audience. Okay, I have so a, a question, if Please I may. Um, so that's that's maybe more related to to the topic of the workshop non-emission. But so it seems that you, as you said, no, you have a dissipative system. You have transport. You can control the spectrum while the energy levels, the widths, and so on, which which looks amazing. And so, have you looked at this as a um, uh, so at, as a non-emission system where you take into account so the dissipation and, and maybe what it gives. So, it, well, it's, it's interested. It's, yeah, my, my question is interested now because it's related also to what I presented before. So I'm curious. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Geraldine, for this very interesting question. In fact, uh, I think there is the beginning of uh, like, or, like there, there is an, like a, uh, the beginning of an answer, but uh, there are already, already very interesting things which have been presented, uh, I, um, which have been done in the context of simply a double quantum dot without magnetic textures in, in microwave cavity. So there was a talk yes. yesterday by Archak uh, who yes. presented that. You, yeah. So it, so so I so I think you are perfectly right. Uh, if I just like um, have a single double quantum dot into a microwave cavity. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they are very interesting. Uh, 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 this can be a very interesting model system for probing non emission physics, uh, mm. because you have like an open quantum system, and it, it, could, it could very well be that um, uh, it's very. Um, so you have a lot of dissipation from the leads. You, you can have a non equilibrium physics because you you have um, uh, you, you can apply bias. Okay, yes. like, uh, like actually Archek was showing yesterday, and so I think that. Um, that it's actually uh, maybe a very uh, uh, nice experimental platform to probe this kind of physics. I think you're you're perfectly right. That's and, and maybe with the magnetic field, uh, maybe with the magnetic field, you see you have one degree of freedom more to control your your system. So uh, so it can be quite powerful. Absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right. The magnetic field might also be very interesting because. Uh, you break time reversal symmetry, so I guess this this can have interesting implications, maybe for in this kind of physics. Yeah, thank you. Takis. Absolutely, thank you for your question. Um, Takis, I have one question. Uh, maybe till the time the audience can think of something. Uh, have you looked at um, experimentally whether you can measure the statistics of these, uh, you know, currents, or uh, is this this doable? Uh, and how easy is it to do these kind of things? Like you're looking at the entire distributions rather than the averages. You mean for the current fluctuations or for the photon yes. statistics? Yes, for both. Yes, yeah. for both, yeah. I think, uh, okay, thanks very much for this question. So I have thought about this, but I have not, so, I, so we have not uh, for the, so far considered uh, doing this, but you're absolutely right. Uh, in principle, this platform is super powerful. Uh, if you use the, all the, um, the, the tools of cavity QED, for example, it could be possible, but, I have, but I'm not, okay, uh, maybe I haven't looked uh, enough into the literature, but I'm not aware of, of uh, uh, a theory work uh, addressing specifically this question. But what I would guess is that it's possible to uh, essentially map uh, the current, for example, the full counting statistics of the current onto uh, the photon correlations uh, uh, which are uh, uh, present uh, interacting with this uh, device in the microwave cavity. See. So, uh, so there were papers, I think, uh, like towards this direction uh, by Peter Samuelson, I think, uh, in Lunda. Uh, uh, this is, uh, but, but but probably there is uh, there's still a lot, a lot to do. Uh, uh, so direct mapping is, uh, I, I'm not sure that this has been uh, uh, done, but uh, yeah. And there were also, I think in, in some sense, uh, um, I think there were some old works by Marcus Boutiqueur, uh, mm -hmm. not with a microwave uh, cavity, but with an LC resonator. I think Simon Nick was the first author, as far as I remember. Uh, mm -hmm. Where essentially you could um, uh, you could um, just map the full counting statistics in a coherent conductor, 
uh, but I, I'm sure uh, Marcus Butica has uh, um, looked into this problem uh, uh, in some way with the, with an LC resonator. Okay. This no, this Thank is uh, yeah, that's very, that's very relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Takis, for this answer. Um, are there any further questions? If not, uh, let us thank. Oh, this hurry, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, is it is it possible to fabricate another uh, quantum dot in the micro in in the same setup so that you can do some Ramsey interferometry to read out the photon states? So that you can 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 you can you repeat the, the is, last part? Is, is it possible to fabricate another uh, circuit uh, close by to this uh, inside the microwave uh, cavity, so that like you can do Ramsey interferometry using the second second circuit? Uh, so I have not thought about Ramsey interferometry, but uh, uh, yes, actually we did this uh, some time ago. It's a Naturecom uh, uh, 2013. Uh, we coupled two single quantum dots. On. Uh, with uh, dissipative leads uh, so in, inside the same microwave cavity. This is a work by Matthew Delbeck. I can send you the, the paper uh, if you uh, send me on, like uh, on on uh, uh, if you send me an email. I send yeah, you the paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, this is impossible. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's thank Takis once again for this wonderful talk. 